There you go. You got it. Well, this morning we're going to look and live as Brother Randy led us in singing. And we're going to open up the Word and we're going to find out some of the things that add, add life to our days. And that's what the Word of God does. It always adds life to our days. Now, in the next couple of weeks, I'm certain there will be some changes made in the way we have our services here as soon as uh, some of this is let up. Maybe perhaps we'll be going to two preaching hours uh, early in the morning uh, and uh, then su uh, preaching and then Sunday school then preaching again and that way we can divide our people up that's what we're looking ahead to so uh, you keep your eyes on the church's web page and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we can and as soon as we can do that uh, correctly and, and uh, so you be praying about that we're looking forward to meeting and get together again with our folks and it'd be a great blessing to us Mark chapter 1 uh, beginning in verse 29, I want to read down through verse 34 as we continue on in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 1, a uh, very interesting, uh, very personal part of the Word of God uh, about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. All right, beginning in verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered uh, unto them. Well, let's go ahead and read some more. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Well, again, Father, this morning we are so grateful to be in the house of God. We know that there are many out there listening who just can't be here. I wish they could. We miss so many of our people. We'll be glad to see their faces again. and We can feel a little bit of back, at least back to normal when those times come. Well, God, this morning we're going to talk about uh, Peter's mother-in-law, something you've shown us in your word, and I trust, God, you'll speak to us. And that we can learn from this, God, and we can grow in our Christian lives because of it. Bless our dear folk who are here. They're a great help to us. Uh, and uh, then uh, you give them a, just a special blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you remember last week's lesson, and it doesn't matter if you did or not, but if you did, if you do remember it, you remember that Peter or James had, or Jesus had just been to a great church service. They had, he had gone to church and they had asked him to preach. And uh, boy, if Jesus would come in here, I'd certainly ask him to preach today. But uh, they asked him to preach. And, uh, and when he did, uh, a man who had a demon... Uh, that demon came out of him and showed itself to the people in the church service there and Jesus delivered that man from that demon and boy what a scene it must have been that morning when Jesus was at church and uh, people were excited about hearing the Bible preached uh, according to verse 27 and and uh, they weren't they went around telling everybody they could as we all do sometimes when we have a, an exciting kind of church service when we see somebody saved or something like that and uh, the news began to spread about what Jesus had done now you remember we said that Mark wrote this book and uh, we believe that of course with all of our heart but also we believe it 
that he wrote it through the eyes of Peter. Peter didn't write a gospel. There's no gospel according to Peter, but we believe that Mark wrote this through the eyes of Peter. Mark, had said, Mark himself was a great Christian man. He was a student, though, under Peter. Peter kind of took him under his wing, as many of the disciples did. They had somebody that they taught. We ought to still be doing those kind of things. And uh, often when Mark is mentioned, he's mentioned with Peter. And uh, like Timothy and Paul and Titus and Paul, it's Peter and Mark. If you can remember it like that. And Peter wrote and authored two other books about the Holy Ghost, First and Second Peter. And it's no surprise to us that he would have just a little part in the Gospels itself. And uh, this is now this story that we read. And the reason I said that is because the story that we read is something very personal in the life of Peter. Uh, it, it was it was a it was a it was a, something that happened in his own life that perhaps Mark never would have known about, and yet Peter wanted to relate to Mark. Mark, this happened one time, and I want you to write it. And God has told me uh, told me to tell you to write it down, and uh, because it speaks of Peter's mother-in-law, his mother-in-law, and uh, that's a very personal thing. I think we could all say. Uh, but verse 29 and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue they entered into the house of Simon which is Peter and Andrew which is Peter's brother uh, and, uh, and, and, and they brought their guest with them that day was James and John and of course the Lord Jesus himself and uh, perhaps all of Peter's household was there I don't know how many children he might have had none are ever mentioned in the Bible but I'm sure all of his whole house was there but, but one name is conspicuously missing, and that's the name of Mark. Mark wasn't there. Mark wouldn't have been there. Mark may, maybe not had even been saved yet, but he wrote about this story. And that's because that Peter, in retelling some of the things, wanted him to know about the healing of his mother-in-law. So let's look at this and uh, see what we can learn from it. Number one, I want to say this, how people are same all over the world and uh, oh it seems like there are certain habits that Christians have that uh, that are very uh, I don't know they're widespread I guess I could say I don't know about what you're going to do tonight today after church but uh, I know this that many people when they uh, go home from church they go home and perhaps the wife's already been cooking up a big meal and and uh, started that morning and she left the roast in the oven and all those kind of things and Sunday afternoon has always been a time for eating for God's people. And go home and fellowship with their family and friends. It's maybe the only time of the week that they do that. And I know a lot of people have spent their whole Christian life just like that. And Sunday dinners are often the greatest times of fellowship that a family could ever have. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so it's, it's no different here. After they left the synagogue, what did they do? The Bible says they went over to... Peter's house and and they were going to have something to eat but when they got there the cook was sick and there was no meal on the table and uh, and so uh, we see the beginning then of the story now I learned from this thing that uh, Jesus likes to come into people's homes I wouldn't give you two cents for a religion that didn't change your home if it didn't change the way you spoke to your wife at home if it didn't change the way you spoke to your children at home, how you behaved at home, I wouldn't give you anything for religion that just came on at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and shut off at 12 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And so Peter and James and John and, and uh, Andrew and uh, all the fellows there went over to Peter's house to have fellowship there together. And, uh, and uh, so... And by the way, I'm going to say to you this morning, Jesus will come into your home if you'll let him. In fact, I think he'd rather be in your home than any place else. After he comes into your heart, I think he wants to go into your home next. Hey, America's only as strong as our homes are. Did you know that? A lot of the blame for what's going on in America today. It's not the government's fault, not the alcoholic's fault, not the uh, homosexual's fault. It's the way the Christians behave in the home. And God can't bless us the way he once could 
and he'll come, Jesus will come into any home that he's invited into. Uh, you know, they used to have, and uh, especially older people, they would have, as you'd walk into their house, they'd have a little plaque on their, on their, uh, on their wall when you came in. And it said something like this, and they had all kinds of different little sayings. But one of them said this, Jesus is the unseen guest in our home. And friend, if you have a sign like that in your home, it's not long until Jesus is seen in your home and you know he's there. And uh, I remember hearing a story one time about a great preacher. I believe it was G. Campbell Morgan. I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. But uh, he had some boys and he had a family. And one day his, his son had built a new home and uh, he was very that new home. He'd just gotten married and built a new home and he invited his dad over. He said, Dad, I want you to come over and look at my new home. And G. Campbell Morgan was full, so very happy to do that. And he said, and his son gave him the tour, you know, walked in the front door, showed him the lawn, walked in the front door, showed him the living room, and then the kitchen and the bedrooms and all the house that he had built there. And uh, when they got through, the boy said to his dad, because he wanted to make his dad proud, and he said, Dad, what did you think about my new home? And he said, Son, it's a beautiful home. God has certainly blessed you. God has helped you. And he said, I'm so proud of you and your family, and, and it's a beautiful new home. But he said, Son, there's one thing that bothered me. He said, What's that, Dad? He said, I looked all through your house as I walked through your house, and there was not one thing, not one thing that would tell somebody who came into this home that it was a Christian home. Not one thing, not one plaque, not one verse, not one picture. Nothing would have told anybody that you were a Christian. And so, Jesus would like to make himself known in your home if you'll let him to do that. People ought to know by looking. I mean, I know they ought to know by hearing that we're Christians, but they ought to know sometimes but by just simply looking at your home, knowing that you're a believer. You don't, it doesn't have to say you're a, a strong believer. It doesn't have to say you're a new believer. It doesn't have to say uh, that, that you're even a good Christian. But it ought to say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ somewhere without you having to say it and you having to tell people. And certainly, you wouldn't want somebody to be surprised to know that you're a Christian. Now, uh, I'm sure it was a very modest home, and they came in, and and they, 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 you know, maybe like many times before, they were expecting something to eat and, you know, to enjoy their fellowship and talk about the service. And, boy, how exciting it was to see that demon uh, be, uh, come out of that man. And, oh, they were excited. But, but, but when they got there, the Bible says very plainly, very gives us this little homey story that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. She was sick. Now, I want you to look at verse 30 for our second point. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. So she was sick. I doubt that this was just a little cold. I doubt that it was just a little, uh, uh, she was just, uh, uh, had a bad day. Uh, it must have been something very, very seriously ill. Perhaps they didn't know it at the time, but God chose to tell us about it, that, that she was a very sick woman. There are so many verses of the Bible that, are, that, that are quick to remind us that God's people are not exempt from trouble. I, I can't overemphasize that very uh, too much. I, I want you to know that somebody has uh, trouble with their teenagers at home or they have trouble uh, with something going on in the home and they're a little bit embarrassed by that maybe at church or uh, maybe it's a husband and wife problem and they go to church and they, they're a little bit embarrassed about that because somebody, they think, people judge them on how good a Christian they may be because of what's going on in their home. Oh, oh they're teenagers running wild. That, that must mean something about the way they're raising their children. Hey, no, the Bible said God's people just are not immune to trouble. Sometimes trouble in a home, God is just trying us and, 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 and developing us and building our faith. And we don't understand how he's doing it, but that's exactly what our, he's doing. And the Bible says in the book of Job that man is born, a man that is born of a woman is full of, as, as of a few days and full of trouble. And if you haven't found that out, 
yet you will someday. And so uh, Peter was one of the most devoted followers of the Lord. Yet here he comes home, and there's now an illness. And probably he's beginning to think, man, what am I going to do? I, I've got to stay and take care of my mother-in-law. My wife's upset, and my kids are upset. And I'm trying to serve God, and now I've got all this to worry about. And what, God, what are you doing here? And yet God was going to use it all. God was going to use all of it. There are a lot of saved people today trying to serve God who are stricken down with some kind of illness or some kind of problem. And it's not the judgment of God on their life. It's not the judgment of God at all in their life. Uh, and, and I hope we're never guilty of believing about any of our friends or Christian brothers and sisters that, that because they have some kind of trouble, whether it's home or anywhere else, that God is somehow judging them for something they've done in their life. That nothing could be further from the truth. Now, if somebody comes to me and say, Preacher, I know why God's sending me this trouble. He's trying to get a hold of me. I've got something in my life. I say, hey, that's up to you and God, between you and God. It's never my part to say that's the judgment of God on their home. Peter was doing his best to serve God. I'm sure his wife must have been saved and the children and all that, uh, all that he could have done, you know, must have been sh shown up in his home. And yet now here he goes home and he says, oh, my, what am I going to do? I've got my, my mother-in-law sick and how am I going to serve God? Well, Jesus was in the home. And that made all the difference that day. And it'll certainly make a difference in your life, too, if you'll just let Jesus have his way in your heart. I hope he's a priority in your life, serving him. I hope that's a great priority of your life. And, and uh, that you, you say, I want to every day in my home, I want to pray and I want to read my Bible. I want to ask God's blessing on it. I want to be a witness in my home. Just make him a priority in your life, no matter where you're at, at work, or at home, or at church, or wherever you may be. But anyway, Peter goes home and his wife's mother lay sick of a fever. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I know a lot of people today, even in this church, who are trying to serve God, who are stricken down with an illness. There are a lot of people in our church that we'll be praying about, you know, who'll be going in for cancer surgery. It's not, I'm thinking about Miss Glenda Norris. She'll be going in, and we're praying for her. And we got Miss Glenda Hoskins. She's been, we've been praying for her. People, people are just stricken down. It just comes with life. And, uh, and, you know, it's just hard to serve God like that all the time but there are people in our church who are going to take medication for the rest of their life they can't help it that's just what the doctor tells them to do and uh, but, but 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 they still want to serve God then then I think Peter's mother-in-law here more than anything else and I want you to get this picture in the message she really represents unsaved people really that's what I get the picture of uh, I don't know know that she was unsaved but I, I, I really honestly believe that she certainly represents unsaved people uh, uh, in the picture that Jesus is trying to paint to us in the Word of God. Uh, she couldn't help Jesus, see? She couldn't help him. Uh, she wanted to work. I don't know. I guess suppose she wanted to do something that day and help the uh, family get the dinner ready and enjoy the fellowship, but she couldn't do that. She just couldn't do it. She was sick. She had a fever. Unsaved people have a fever, too. They do. They really, really do. They have this fever in their life. It's, a call, it's caused by sin. And uh, r r really, uh, they're sick in their soul, and only Jesus, the great physician, can fix that kind of an illness. And that's what, that was all picture, that's all represented right here in the in this story of Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, unsaved people don't always have uh, burn, un, you know, that they're, they're, uh, people who have, uh, who are unsaved they're, they're sinners now let, let's talk about this I mean you're a sinner I'm a sinner I'm just a saved sinner and somebody else is an unsaved sinner but, but uh, unsaved people sometimes behave just as well as saved people do let's just be honest about it but, but they, there's some things they can't do they just can't do it because there's this fever in their soul that they, they just and God, and God just no said no you can't do that. Uh, I I guess the most dangerous thing about this COVID nineteen that we're facing today. In fact, the very reason that we're uh, quarantined today it, it's not because uh, 
people in our county are sick. Uh, it's not because people are uh, at, at home and they're laying there in a fever. That, that's not the reason that we're quarantined. We're quarantined because of the people who might have the virus and don't know it. And they're going on right along in their life and nothing about them, uh, nothing about their life has changed. They, they, they wouldn't, if, you, if they've got the fever, they don't know it. A lot of unsaved people are just like that. They're sinners. They, they just don't seem to understand that they're sinners and they've got this terrible uh, si- sickness running through their veins. And they behave almost sometimes like everybody else. But then they have this uh, uncontrollable outburst, let's say. And then you see what sin is doing to them. Uh, they have no symptoms per se. I'm talking about a lot of good people. You know what? You know what the worst kind of goodness is? The worst kind of goodness is the kind that makes you believe that you're going to go to heaven because of that goodness. Man, we all need to know that we're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so she 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 she, she had this fever. And unsaved people have that fever also of sin. And uh, um, often they don't realize it until they hear the Word of God preached to them. And then they begin to understand the Word of God convicts them about that sin, about not having Christ as their Savior in their heart. Did you ever see a dog with distemper? I tell you, it's the most disheartening thing you could ever see in your life. I, I hate. I, don't, I hope they don't have that a lot anymore, but... But a dog with distemper is the most awful thing in the world to see. Here's the reason that a dog with distemper can go along for a day without or so even, or hours, and, and you'll never know the dog's sick. He'd be wagging his tail and, uh, and, uh, and going along sniffing and barking and all the things that a dog does, scratching his fleas. But then all of a sudden, he'll be taken over by a seizure. And you're sitting there watching that dog, and he just has all kinds of uh, seizures, and he begins to uh, foam mouth, maybe run around and run into things. And it's the most awful thing you could ever see. Sinners are like that, too. Yeah, I'll show you what I mean. Some unsaved people are just uh, gentle and kind, and they can be uh, so good. And, but then in the next minute, they'll explode with a, 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 a passion or or some weakness or some sin will just overrun them and overtake them until they don't even know what they're doing. Let Jesus come into your heart and get a hold of those things, friend. That's the only cure for that kind of thing. So here she lay, uh, 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 sick of a fever. She couldn't couldn't do anything and couldn't do a thing in the world about who she was or what was going on. She, uh, She had to succumb to that sickness. And by the way, may I say this before we get too far along in this. Christians still uh, sometimes struggle with that lingering old nature, nature too. Sometimes, even though we're saved, we still have our bursts of distemper sometimes. I hate to talk about it. I hate to admit it, but it's still true in all of our lives. But, but there she was. She was laying right there and couldn't do anything at all. Now, I want you to see something else. Uh, and th- and that I believe is the heart really of the story. She had to be healed before she could ever serve the Lord Jesus Christ. She had to be healed. So there she was laying in bed. I, I she couldn't do anything. Uh, she had to be touched by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's exactly what it says he did in verse thirty one. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. He didn't do anything else. He didn't he didn't do anything. He just came over and touched her. Just lifted her up. He said, let me help you get up. And she took his hand. And when she took his hand, I can just imagine that fever, that illness, that disease, whatever it might have been that got her down, it just went away. He just, he didn't say, he didn't put spit on her eyes. He didn't uh, touch her tongue. He didn't touch her ears like he's done in some of the other places that, uh, where he healed people in the Bible. He just reached out there and touched her. And you know, most salvation experiences are just like that. Maybe somebody will be sitting down in the church house and they'll hear a sermon preached and God will begin to speak to their heart and, 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 and they'll say, I want to be saved, I want to be saved. And they'll come forward down to a church at an altar, old-fashioned altar somewhere. Or maybe they're at home. It doesn't matter where you're at when you get saved. But they'll come down and 
and then they'll bow down and they'll say Jesus come into my heart and, and Jesus will come in and they'll get up and they'll walk back to their seat and, and maybe there's no crying maybe there's no shouting maybe there's no big movement of the God or anything just some simple sinner getting saved when they get saved that moment they're touched by the Lord Jesus Christ and now all of a sudden everything's changed I'll tell you this I believe most salvation experiences are just like that he just reaches down and touches them listen friend he's not don't be don't be too interested in having some kind of a wild and uh, experience in your life I'm glad for people who have them but most of us folks just don't have an experience like that oh I'm not saying we're not moved and we're not changed and we don't feel a great burden lifted up but there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, mysterious activity going on when we get saved. By, by faith do we get saved. We just simply begin to trust Him to save us. And that's enough. That's enough for God. He didn't call a great crowd of people over. He didn't do anything. He just reached out and touched her. She held out her hand and grabbed a hold of him. You know when the Bible talks about Moses when all the children of Israel were bitten by those poisonous serpents and Jesus and we sang about it this morning a little bit but they came through the wilderness there and 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 Moses had prayed he said oh God heal these people from this awful uh, uh, death that they're gonna die and and so what did he do he said build this serpent and put him on a pole and and walk through the camp and anybody who looks up at that serpent will be healed of that disease so here's an old man saying there, and somebody come by, Grandpa, make sure you look at the serpent when it comes by. Oh, I don't believe that. How could that heal me from this terrible bite of the serpent? No, Grandpa, all you got to do is look. And he just, that old boy came through the camp. Maybe it was Moses, maybe it was Aaron. And they walked through that camp and had that big old long pole and so everybody could see it. You know, and Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. And just like the cross, that, that guy went through the camp and held that so everybody could see it. And it didn't make any difference if you're close by or a long ways away. You could look and be saved and healed. It was no big movement. There was no... A fire in the sky only somebody just simply looked and lived you think they ever forgot that oh it may not have been a wild-eyed experience but you think they ever forgot that even a simple thing like looking up and living and they realized that how they could immediately feel their illness leave them the poison leave them the fever leave them leave them left them and 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 you, hey it don't matter what kind of an experience you have it just makes a difference that you've had an experience and so she came down he she laying there in bed and jesus came up over to her he didn't say hey draw me a crowd and he didn't say go mix me up a potion he didn't say anything. he just reached down there and touched her and if i would ask most of the people in this room today that's exactly how you got saved that's exactly how you got saved you just, had, you just had this experience and you look back at it now and you say I know God saved me I know he saved me because my life's been different ever since and I've never gotten away from that day no I, I'm just simply saying uh, she had to be touched and, and, uh, and, and that's all it was just a simple touch from the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, all of us need that same touch nobody, now, now listen to me nobody can live the Christian life until Jesus comes in their heart to do that now we can we can put on a pretty good show sometimes we can put on a pretty good act I, I, we know all the church lingo and we know what to say and all those kind of things but nobody truly can live for the Lord and serve him until they're touched by him it's impossible to live for God and to serve him because here's what the Christian life is listen to me are you listening because this is so important the Christian life is not you living the Christian life. The Christian life is Christ coming in and living that life through you and in you. That's what the Christian life is. It's not me doing this and me doing that and me doing that. It's Christ coming in and saying, I want you to go do that. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Let's go over and do that. Let's pray for this guy. Let's go witness to that guy. Whatever it might be, Christ living in you. So often I found out in my ministry that lost people will look at saved people. Hey, and by the way, may I say to everybody in this room this morning, people that know you go to church, 
people who know that you are a Christian, they watch you. They watch you, watch you, watch you. And, uh, uh, and uh, they're judging you. They don't mean to. They just, sometimes they just need to know what it's like to be a Christian. And so they watch you. They're not trying to compare you with anybody else most of the time. They're just simply needing somebody to, to show them what it's like to live the Christian life. And, uh, and, uh, and so, and, 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 and so uh, here is a, here's this lady. She's laying there so very, very ill. But uh, saved people look at people like you and you and you and all of you. And they, and they say, I could never do what they do. They don't understand how you can get up and go to church. Why aren't you going to the lake like everybody else and all the things that we normally do on these weekends? I saw the golf course was already half full this morning as I drove by. And, uh, uh, boy, I wished I was there. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, and, uh, and, uh, the, 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 and they say, I, I could never know the Bible like they know it. I, I don't understand the Bible. I, and they tried to read it, and they, 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 they can't read it, and they don't understand it. But they look at you and they say, they, they, they watch you. And they say, I, I can't do that. And you know, they're right. They're right. They can't do that. But the truth is, friend, uh, uh, you know, uh, those people that are watching, one day, once upon a time, they felt the same way that they do. We, looked, we watched other people and we thought, how can they go to church so faithfully like that? How can they give? How can they, how can they uh, serve God like that? You see, they don't understand that you can't live the Christian life until Jesus Christ lives in you. And we all know that now. We think it's some kind of a magic potion or something uh, happens when you, you start going to church. That's not what happens. It's when Christ comes in and then all of a sudden you don't have to worry about living the Christian life. You let Christ live it for you. So here she is. I have a picture of Peter's mother-in-law in my own mind's eye. I don't have a picture of her, but I have a picture of in my own mind what she must have been like, and probably you do too. I, I'm sure she was a sweet, good lady. Just almost confident about that. I mean, most uh, uh, ladies, uh, their mother-in-laws and grandmothers, there's just some sweet, good spirit about them. We'll be burying a lady this afternoon was a lady just like that just a good sweet lady and you know that doesn't sound like much does it but it is it's a big thing in a world that there's not many good sweet Christian people boy when you see those people and you, you got to let them go how hard how your heart's broken about that but anyway I'm sure she was a good sweet lady always busy she lived there at Peter's house you know back in those days they uh, I noticed the Bible says Andrew lived there also they went to the house of Peter and Andrew Andrew was also there. And uh, so a lot of people of that home that, and that family all lived in the same dwelling. It doesn't say how big it was or anything like that, but that's just the way it was. They just lived together. They had money. I'm sure it was, a, <laughs> again, a very modest home. And, uh, and so she, she was always busy and helping and, and, and helping not only Peter and the, her, her daughter and, and her grandkids, but probably Andrew, too. He was part of the household. She was just one of those <coughs> sweet ladies that we all see so much in the Christian life she did the, when she wasn't uh, preparing a meal uh, perhaps she was busy doing some household chores anything to help her daughter out and to help the grandkids out perhaps when she wasn't cooking a meal she was mending socks or sewing up this or cleaning the house and all those things and, uh, and in fact I, I imagine in my own mind she loved doing it she was glad to be of a help. It doesn't say anything about Peter's father-in-law. And I get the idea she was already a widow. Maybe not. Maybe not. But uh, she was always wanting to do something that would make life easier for her family. And then when she got this fever, she tried. She Maybe perhaps that morning when they'd went to synagogue, she got up said I'm going to fix something for Jesus and his friends I know they'll be here and Peter will be here with his friends and, and I, I want to do something for them but that morning she got up maybe she had just just had aches and body pains and, and she said well I'll, I'll stay in bed another 30 minutes and 
she stayed in 30 minutes and she didn't get any better in fact she got a little bit worse and about maybe earlier than the morning the daughter comes in mother are you all right what's you know it's not like in bed so late she said daughter i don't feel well in fact i don't feel good at all and and now the daughter's a little bit worried about the whole thing and and uh, and uh, she she says well i'll give you this and puts a cold rag on her head you know and and does all she can to minister to her mother an hour went by and then another hour and still she didn't feel any better and peter and and jesus and all the family were coming home and they expected a meal and she felt so bad and she tried again to get up and she said oh i i can't do anything i'd like to do something but she couldn't do anything to serve jesus She couldn't bear to think about it her daughter in there she thought taking care of the kids and here I am laying in bed and now daughter's got to fix the meal and do all the things that I would normally do to help but she couldn't do anything she couldn't do a thing she wanted to work but she couldn't I get the idea again that a lot of unsaved people would like to do something for the Lord but they just can't do it there's something missing something empty in their life something they don't have that you have do you know God equips every one of us to do his work do you know God will never ask you to do anything that he won't do through you if you'll just say I'll do it God let's go together he's waiting for you to do it you put something on he put something on your heart and he said, I want you to talk to that guy. Well, I've never talked to anybody ever before, God. I, I wouldn't do any good. But God said, I want you to talk to him. Finally, we give in and we go and we say, hey, can I pray for you? Is there something wrong? I'd like to invite you to church or whatever it might be. Have you ever been saved? And you think, I can't do it. And you're right, you can't do it. But Jesus can do it through you. Maybe you'd like to. Maybe you sit around here sometime and you say, boy, I'd like to understand my Bible. I'd like to be able to pray like Brother Randy. I'd like to do these things. But you can't do it. Sometimes you just got to say, God, I want you to do it in me. I'm just going to follow you. I'm just going to listen to you. I'm just going to try to be so obedient to you. But I've talked to a lot of lost people. Preacher, I'd like to be saved. And I would be saved if I thought I could live it. I just thought I could live the Christian life. Well, you can't. I'll just, just be honest with you. You can't live it. None of us could live it until Jesus came into our heart. And it was only then that we could begin to live for the Lord. Now, look at verse 31. Uh, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. Well, what did she do? She said, well, I'm going to convalesce here for a little while. I'm going to sit down and kind of build up my strength. No, she was ready to go. Boy, she was ready and ready to will, ready, ready and willing to serve God. She said, I'm going to do something for the Lord. She ministered unto them. You know, let me tell you something this morning. If you've got an idea about Christian life, let me tell you what it's all about. I can give it to you in one word. If you want to be saved, I can tell you exactly what God's going to call you to do. You ready? It's to minister to others. You may not want to do that, but that's what God will ask you to do. That's what he'll lead. You can always bet that it's God talking to you when it's, he's asking you to minister, to minister or to help someone else. That's always what Jesus did. And that's what he'll always ask his people to do. How can I help? What can I do? Is there anything that I can do to help you during this virus? Anything that I can help you to do? God always brings compassion to people. And so she ministered and she served immediately. That's the best kind of Christianity. When Jesus touches a man, he wants us to do something, anything. Be baptized, witness to other people, learn the Bible, grow, uh, do any kind of service for him. That Listen, if you'll start... If you'll start when you're, when you're brand new, listen, if you'll start serving God then, it'll do something in your life that the devil can never take away. You know, there's an old saying that we sometimes used to say, you've got uh, to strike the metal while it's hot. You've got to shape it while it's hot. And that's what God wants to do when you're first saved. He wants to begin shaping you for what he's going to later use you for. 
And you may not understand it. You may not know what it is. But God knows exactly what he's going to do with you if you will let him do it. And so he begins to, he'll say immediately, after you get saved, he'll say, now you better, you need to go tell somebody you're saved. Or whatever it may be. And, but what he's doing, he's molding you and making you into something uh, that he wants you to do later on. In the, and, and Maybe not even later on. Maybe just immediately he'll do it. But anyway, she immediately got up and began to serve him. There's something very powerful about a new convert that perhaps he or she doesn't really understand. I, I don't think they really do. Because though sometimes old converts are a blessing to unsaved people, new converts are quite a blessing to old converts. We look at you and we watch you too. We watch you after you've been saved or after you've been baptized and we watch you. We want to know what God is doing. We get excited when we see you pray. We get excited when, we, uh, uh, when, we, when, we, when you ask us questions about the Bible. It tells us something. And we remember, back, we remember back when we were first saved and all the new that was involved in that beginning of that new life. And it excites us again when we see uh, new Christians begin to, God begin to work in the hearts of new Christians. We realize that the more the things change, the more they stay the same. And we see God working. We watch what God does in your lives. Maybe first time you ever prayed in public oh my how nerve-wracking that is but we watch you blunder through it and we're happy for you and excited for you and you may be embarrassed to death maybe the first time you ever speak or you have to get in front of the church and do something you just worry to death but we look at you and marvel God just blesses our heart it's an encouragement to us I want to show you something and I want you to know this is so very important to read this and understand this you know what Jesus asked her to do immediately after, after, she, after she was saved? He asked her to do something that was very easy for her to do. Uh, it was very suitable for her. She was used to doing what he now asked her. What she used to do for others, now she was going to do for him. He didn't ask her to do something different. He just asked her to do something, what she was doing then, to do it for him. I mean, I, I, uh, you, you know, I mean this. She didn't go down in the street and preach. Jesus didn't expect her to do that. Why? Well, that would have been so foreign to her. She, would, she wouldn't have wanted to do anything like that. Uh, he didn't, she didn't demand to be an apostle because she was one of the first ones saved in the beginning of this new movement called Christianity. She didn't run around and complain about what others were doing that she didn't get to do. God said, I want you to do what you always have always done. Now, just do it for me. Uh, uh, you, you know, and she, she, she just got, I know people sometimes worry, well, if I get saved, what will God do? What will God ask me to do? I promise you, he won't ask you to do anything that you hate to do. Why would he do that for? That doesn't make any sense. And if he does ask you to do something you're not used to doing, he'll help you to fall in love with doing it. I promise you that. But he's not going to ask somebody, you say, Preacher, I, I'm not used to going. I would never be able to go overseas. Well, good. Don't go overseas. Stay here. Stay here and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people like to go traveling. A lot of people like to uh, go to a tribal people. A lot of people would like the challenge of going overseas and taking it out. You say, I would never like that. Well, good. God give you something else to do. He took her and what she was already doing for him, uh, for her family. God said, you just keep doing it. Just do it now for me. Blessed are they who do what they can do and blessed are they, they who do what they should do. That's good enough, friend. We could change the world. We could absolutely change the world if people would only realize that God will do through you and in you what you're already doing now for yourself or someone else so uh, I mean he just he's not going to ask I don't want you to be afraid of that and whatever God would ask you to do later he's going to give you the willpower to do it he's going to give you the love for it I promise you he really really will so she arose and prepared a sermon no that's not what she did she arose and got a Sunday school lesson ready. No, she arose and prepared a supper. 
or a dinner, whatever it might have been. And God blessed her for it. And she will be rewarded in heaven just as much as somebody else who preached or went or did anything else. There'll be something there waiting for her because she did what she could do. And God blessed her for it. People today, I, I know they're looking for the will of God in their life. This is right and, uh, for you to do that. I'm glad you feel that way. And, but what is it that you do best? Let me ask you right now. What is it that you do best? You say, well, I'm, I'm a good contractor or I'm a good. Stay what, with what you're doing. Let God have it. Then watch what he does with you. What is it that you do best? What is it you've been doing the longest? Just give it to the Lord and see what he will do. Well, I don't know. We make so much fun of mother-in-laws and have so much uh, fun at their expense, and God bless them for it. I, ha I have a wonderful mother-in-law, and she's been a sweet, dear blessing to me. And, uh, and so God blesses you with the family. And uh, let's all try to serve him together if we could. All right, would you all stand with me, please? And we're going to be dismissed until it's ready for preaching time. Go ahead and shut that off. Sometimes I feel this girl.